We're, if you're a guest here today, we've been going through a series on the book of James, and today we're going to start the last chapter, chapter 5. So if you would, look at James chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. I entitled my message today, You Can't Take It With You. So would you stand as we read God's Word together? James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Wow, that's an introduction, isn't it? Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts. In a day of slaughter, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. God bless his word. Thank you. Please be seated. In this passage, James takes a whole different approach, and it almost sounds like that he's writing to lost people, pagans that don't even know Christ. But I want you to remember this letter is to the churches of those that have been dispersed out of Jerusalem that are in the Judea and Samaria area. And James is writing to instruct them, and there's a problem because there are some wealthy people in these churches who have gotten their eye off the ball. They've started paying more attention to their stuff than to the Lord. And James is writing to these Christian people who have bowed down to the idol of materialism. And these Christians have let money and possessions become their idol. Listen, an idol is not just a little fat man in a lotus position. An idol is anything that you place in your heart, in your life, in a priority above God. Whatever that may be, whether it's job, whether it's a hobby, whether it's money, whether whatever it is, you place that in priority above your obedience to God, your allegiance to God, and it's an idol. And James talks about that here. It's very possible for us as Christians to get off, off the bubble when it comes to money and materialism. It's very easy, especially in this country, for us to become materialistic and not handle our money in the right way, even become irresponsible with it. I heard about a guy named Fred. Fred was a very generous kind of guy. He's always willing to help somebody out that needed it and, and uh, just known for his generosity. And they came, Fred got sick, and he up and died. And they had his funeral, and after his funeral, three other mutual friends got together, and they were talking and talking about Fred. And they said, you know, Fred was such a, such a generous guy. And they said, yeah, he really was. And one of the guys spoke up and said, guys, I'm, I'm really ashamed to tell you this. But he said, I got I to gotta tell somebody, I got to be honest. Fred was so generous, he loaned me $2,000 when I was in trouble. And I never paid him back. And I didn't have enough money to pay him back today, but I, I got 10 crisp $100 bills, and I put it in his casket when I walked by. The second guy looked at him, and he said, you know, it's amazing that you said that, because Fred loaned me $4,000, and I never paid him back. He never said a word about it. And... I still didn't have enough money to pay him back today, so I took $2,000 out of my bank account, and I 
I put it in his casket when I walked by. And the third guy looked at him and he said, I cannot believe you guys. You, you shorted him. You didn't even pay him back in full. He said, I want to tell you what, Fred loaned me $10,000, and before this funeral, I wrote out a check for the whole amount, $10,000. And when I walked by that casket, I put that check in the casket with him, and I paid my debt back to him. You know, sometimes we can get money out of, out of, the, out of the right place and have the wrong priority about money. And that's what James is talking about here. And so let me quickly tell you some lessons here that James teaches us about our wealth, about our possessions, about stuff. First, first thing James says is that your wealth on this earth is temporal and it's subject to the rages of time. If you haven't learned it yet, guess what? Money and stuff can appear and disappear very quickly. If you don't believe that, if you have some investments in the stock market, take a look at what it's worth today and see what it was compared to six months ago. I'll never forget when I went to my, the first church that actually gave me some retirement money to put into retirement. I put it into our Southern Baptist Guidestone account, and uh, I was so Excited, told Diana, I said, you know, I'm never going to be old enough. We're ever going to need this. But the church gives us kind of neat to have a retirement account, you know. And one thing I realized, I'd never done this before. I'd never looked at the stock market before. I'd never looked at the Dow Jones. Didn't have a clue what it was or the S&P or NASDAQ. I didn't know, didn't care, never looked at it. But as soon as I had money in that thing, I started looking at it. Every day. Has it gone up $2? Has it gone up 50 cents? Has it gone down? Oh, it went down! You know, and you start panicking. Money can disappear very quickly. And James is saying also in this that when materialism is our focus, our mood and our energy changes with it. Every time there's Man, that was a sneeze, wasn't it? <laughs> kind of scared me there for a minute. <laughs> but every time that materialism fluctuates, so does our mood. If we get more stuff, we're happier. We lose some of our stuff, we're sadder. And so we're constantly on an emotional roller coaster because of an idol called money. We also will sacrifice others' trust and welfare for the sake of our own if materialism is our God. Perfect example in the Bible is Ahab, King Ahab of Judah. He saw Naboth's vineyard and Ahab wanted it. Now Ahab had everything that he could possibly want. He had all the vineyards in the world. And here was this one guy who had one vineyard and Ahab said, I want that vineyard. And he made an offer to Naboth to buy his vineyard. And Naboth said, Naboth said King, Ahab is not for sale. Not for sale. I'm keeping my vineyard. So what does Ahab do? He goes home. He has a pity party. He gets the poochy lip. He's laying on his bed and you know the story. Jezebel comes in and says, Honey, what in the world is wrong with you? And he said, Do you want to let me have his vineyard? She said, I'll take care of it for you. And she has Naboth murdered so that Ahab can take a piece of property. When materialism is our God, we will misuse and abuse others. Here's the second thing. That James says here in verse, verse 4 that the, the money, it, when it's our idol, as I said, we, we misuse, mistreat others. And James says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who moved your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. Here are these landowners. They were the rich people. And they had laborers to harvest their crops, plant their crops, and they weren't paying them their wages. 
And what, what James is saying here for us, an application for us, is this. God wants us to use what we have to bless others. The Apostle Paul talks about that in the book of Acts. When he quotes Jesus, now the funny thing about this quote is we never see it anywhere in the, in the, um, in the Gospels, but evidently Jesus said it. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul said, Did not the Lord say it is better to give than to receive? And that's true, isn't it? We, we experience that. When we bless others, we have, we have the real blessing in our life, the joy of knowing that we've helped someone else. And we also will use that money in a way that glorifies the Lord. So number three, we rush through this. God is going to judge idolatry of materialism. In verse 4b, in the last part of that verse, James says, those who are crying out, who did the harvesting, have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts. God, God's hearing their agony. God is hearing their pain. God is hearing their hunger. And he's not going to forget about it. God hates every form of idolatry. Not just materialism. Any kind of idolatry. The Jews teach that the strongest, the most important verse in the whole Bible is the, is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That means you can't have any other gods before him. God hates idolatry. And you say, well, pastor, how do I know if, I'm, if, if materialism is, is my idol? Very simple. Take out your checkbook and audit your checkbook. And where your money is going, that's where your heart is. That's where your priority is. That's where your allegiance is. One last thing. James says that when we worship materialism, we're taking our eyes off of eternity. He says in the last two verses, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. James is saying this, this is the time. This may be the last day. And whether or not it's the time that Christ comes again, you're not going to live very long. It's in the last days. And so the question for us this morning is this. Do we really believe God's promises? God says, you follow me. You obey me. Number one, I'm going to give you eternal life. Number two, I'm going to give you a place in heaven with me. And all of my glory, you're going to share in that. You're going to be an heir and a joint heir with my son, Jesus Christ. God's promises to us for eternity, for eternity, are beyond our imagination. So, if we make materialism and money our idol here, is it that we really don't believe God's promises for eternity? God promises us so much, and it's not going to be just for a little while. In fact, if we bow down to that idol of materialism, we have lost the big picture of what God wants for your life. God wants so much more for you than just a pile of stuff. God wants for you His great will that will give you abundant life as Jesus promised.